I want to talk to you about embracing God's vision for your life. Embracing God's vision for your life. Say that. Embracing God's vision for your life. And many, many years ago, during the old Soviet Union, when, when, when they were, you know, against religion and, and the KJB was really, uh, I, I guess, more active now in, terms, in trying to control people's lives, uh, this Orthodox priest was walking when he was confronted uh, by a KJB agent who told him to stop and then asked him three questions. Who are you? Why are you here? Where are you going? And so the Orthodox priest, of course, complied and answered each question, told him who he was, why he was here, and where he was going. But just before they parted ways, the priest spoke to him one more time and said, thank you, sir, for asking me the three most important questions anybody can ask of himself. Who are you? Why are you here? Where are you going? Do you know the answers to those questions? Every single one of us needs to embrace not just any vision, but God's vision for our lives. It makes all the difference in the world. When you embrace the vision of God for your life, it's going to change you in many ways. And in, in every way, it's going to be for the, for the better. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet done that, I want to encourage you in this message, first of all, to recognize that God indeed has a vision, a very personal vision for you. And I want to help you this afternoon to say yes to it. You say, but Bishop, I don't know what it is. You know what? Before you will even discover the details, I've learned you've got to say yes to him. If, if you say, you got to give me, you got, God, you got to show me it first. Before I say yes to it, you probably would never discover the details. But you go ahead and by faith, say, God, yes, to your vision for my life. And when you say yes to him, he begins to order your steps and you start to discover what his specific plan is for you, the details of which fulfill his vision for you. Are you ready to say yes to God and to his will, whatever his will might be, wherever his will might lead? Hallelujah. We're going we're gonna to show you at the very end of the service, we're going to let those of you who haven't yet seen our new proposed sanctuary, we're going to help you to see that, because we want you to have a vision of what that building is going to look like. How many of you here have not yet seen, well, let me say it this way, how many of you have already seen the video or the rendering of the, of the new sanctuary that we're going to build? Okay, it looks like maybe about 50% of you. How many of you have not yet seen it? Okay, well, some of you didn't raise your hand either way, but that's okay. But, but, but if you have not yet seen it, we're going to let you see it, because we want everybody to get a picture in their mind and in their heart of what that building is going to look like, right? And we want you to do that because we want you to see it. But you see, visions are empowering. There's something about having a clear picture of where you're going that does a lot for you. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we're going to show you that, but I guarantee you, if you haven't seen it yet, you're going to see that it's beautiful. All of us who have seen it have been moved by how beautiful this building is, and, and uh, we thank God that, that by the grace of God, it will get done. And, and it's going to be awesome to see it being built over there. Can you see it? Amen. Okay. One foot at a time being built one day at a time, one week at a time, week after week after week, until the entire building is complete. It's going to be amazing to see that process. And then I can imagine the good feeling we're going to feel. The day we dedicate it, how amazing it's going to be when we, when we present the completed building 
to the Lord. The building he has helped us build for his glory. Amen? When we present that to him for his glory and for the salvation of the world, we're going to feel good. Can you, I said we're going to feel good. Thank God for that. It's going to be an awesome feeling. And for many of us, in fact, I would dare say for all of us, it's going to be one of the highest honors we will ever receive in our lives when, when our names or the name of our family, uh, when, those, when our name is memorialized on a, on a plaque, on a, on a, on a stone, on, 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 on the wall of faith, because we want to do that. And the reason we want to do that is because we want our names to serve as a witness and a testimony to generations that will come after us of the sacrifices we made in our generation on their behalf. You, 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 you didn't hear me. No. We're going to have a wall of faith, and we're going to put the names of those who make sacrifices, not just so we can feel good about our part, but so that our names on the wall can serve, hopefully, as an inspiration to generations that will follow us, that there once lived a group of people who sacrificed on their behalf. Amen? And hopefully when they see the number of people, the names of people, and the levels of sacrifices that were made for them, that the story of our sacrifice will inspire them to make equal sacrifices for the generations that will follow. There's something about knowing the story of what others that came before you have done that inspires you to want to do at least as much or more. That's why God records the story of men like Abraham and like David, and like Daniel, and like Paul. It's not there just to tell a story. It's there to inspire us. That watching them, these cloud of witnesses, we can be inspired to live for God like they did, to obey God like they did, to pursue God's vision for our lives in the way they pursued. We're inspired by their example. Every time a preacher preaches about David, or preaches about Daniel, or preaches about Paul, something happens in you that inspires you to want to be more like them. Well, guess what? Our story is being written. And, 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 and our names will be placed on the wall. Not so we can boast, but so we can inspire others that will come after us. Because this building is not going to be just for us. We're going to enjoy it the buildings, but even more important, it's going to be for future generations. Are you listening to me? So it's, 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 it's going to be amazing, and, and that's going to be one of the highest honors we have. But now, as beautiful as the building is, and those of you who haven't seen it, you'll get to see it later, um, what's far more important than, than, than the beauty of the building and what's far more wonderful than the building itself is what the building will be used for. You didn't hear me. What is far greater, what is far more amazing, what is far more wonderful than the beauty of the building itself is what the building will be used for. How, how God is going to use it. How we are going to use it to make the future better for, for ourselves, for our children, and far beyond them for generations yet unborn. When, when we consider the plan that God has for the building. Hear me, it's not the building, but it's the plan that God has for it that makes the building worth the $10 million or so that is estimated. You hear me? Amen. I said it's not the building, but the plan that God has for the building. The way God intends to use it that makes the building worth the estimated $10 million that it's going to cost us to get it erected. Building a building just for the sake of having a building does not excite me one bit. But building a sanctuary, my goodness, for the worship of God, building a sanctuary for the glory of God, building a sanctuary for the salvation of the world, that is something I can get excited about. That is something I can give to, that is something I can sacrifice 
in order to make a reality. Not building a building, but building a sanctuary for the glory of God. Building a sanctuary for the worship of God. Building for the salvation of the world, both the world we now live and the world that is to come. To God be the glory. I can get excited about that. And I can sacrifice to see that become a reality. Are you hearing me? And that's God's plan. He has an awesome plan for the building. But listen to me. It's important that each of us see what God wants to do with the building and, and hopefully embrace it and allow God to use us in building that sanctuary. But do you know what's even more important than that? It's for you to see and embrace God's vision for you. Yeah, God has a plan and a vision for the sanctuary, but what's even more important is for you and me to see and embrace God's vision for you. Who are you? Why are you here? Where are you going? What's far more important than the building is you seeing and embracing God's vision for you. You mean, Bishop, God has a personal vision for me? Most certainly. If God has a vision for a building, <laughs> is there any question that he would have a vision for you who are far more valuable than the building? He didn't die for the building. He died for you. He didn't send his only begotten son to the world to die for a building. He sent his only begotten son to the world to die for you. If God has a plan for a building, how much more does God have a plan for you who are created in this image? How much more? Listen, if he has enough interest in you that he took time this morning to number your hair, to, to, to see how many pieces of strands you lost last night, you, know, you smile a little bit. You all just, at least, that should I, that should I evoke some. Go, go ahead. Practice smiling. Amen. If God took enough interest in you, or takes enough interest to know the numbers, the number of hairs on your head, you can be certainly, he has enough interest in you to have a plan for your life and a vision for you. Are you hearing me? And there's scripture to back that. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Let's read that together. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand. Amen. I look, I look at you and, and, and I tell you no lie, every one of you is beautiful. Every one of you is a masterpiece. You said, Bishop, how do you know? I know every one of you is a masterpiece because that scripture says every one of you is his workmanship. And that word workmanship actually means masterpiece, work of art. I know each person that I'm facing right now is a masterpiece because each one of you was created by the master creator himself. God himself designed you, formed you, and shaped you. And if you are the result of the master creator, you are a masterpiece. Amen. Come on, look at the person next to you. Say, you're looking at a masterpiece. Say, you're looking at a work of art. Oh yeah, God didn't just slap you together. No, God designed you. God made you. Amen. That's what the scripture says. You are his workmanship. Now, notice, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for Good works which God prepared when? Prepared when? So if God prepared works beforehand for you to walk in, that can only mean that he had a plan beforehand for you. Amen? Are you hearing me? So, so what this scripture teaches us is that before God created you, before he fashioned you, 
He had a plan or a vision in mind concerning you. Amen. He had certain works that he wanted you to walk in. And the works he wanted you to walk in determine the way he created you. No, no. He, he had a plan of what you would look like, of what you would be, and of what you would do. And it is that plan, that vision, that motivated your creation. Uh, let, let, let me say it another way. Maybe, maybe I'll get some response from y'all. I'm working hard. You guys are making me work too hard. For those of us who have seen the picture of the building and those of us who will see it, I want you to understand the picture, the vision, the idea predates the sanctuary. The sanctuary isn't up yet, but that idea is already three years ahead of it. So the plan, the idea, the vision is born first. It's conceived first. It is envisioned first. And then everything that is done afterwards is done with the goal of creating what has already been envisioned. Listen to me, have you been created? But, what you need to understand, you may be 20 years old, you may be 30 years old, you may be 50 years old, that's how long you've been existing. But the idea of you predated you. Oh, you got to hear me. The idea of you, you may be 20 years, but the idea of you is ageless. Oh, you, you didn't hear me. I said God saw you, God knew you, God envisioned. The reality is you are an inspired idea that has been formed. You are an inspired idea that has been made flesh. In the beginning was the word, the idea, the vision. But the word now was being made flesh. So when Jesus showed up on the earth, it was the manifestation of an inspired idea that God had in ageless past. You are the manifestation of an inspired idea that entered into the mind and heart of God in the, in, in the past, in eternity past. The idea of you is what motivated God to create you. And to design you just the way you are, looking the way you are with your exact DNA. Let me, let me help you, because I really want you to get this. I'm not trying to be cute. I'm telling you the truth. Are you hearing me? Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. God said to Jeremiah, before I formed you, before I formed you, I knew you. The idea of you existed long before I begin to form you in your mother's womb. Amen. Before you were born, I sanctified you and I ordained you. Long before I created you in the womb, I already had a plan. I already had a purpose. I already had a vision for you. Amen. I already had an inspired idea. You were an inspired idea long before you came into manifestation. Come on, say to the person next to you, you're looking at an inspired idea. And the truth is, listen to me, your presence here, your existence here today, you are the fulfillment of one of God's most important visions. You are the manifestation and the expression of one of God's most inspired and creative ideas. You didn't just happen, God saw you first. The idea of you enter God's heart and mind. When God was creating the world, with, with the future he had in mind for the world, at some point, you enter his mind. At some point, a picture of you, of somebody with your looks, somebody with your DNA, entered the mind and heart of God. God saw it. Amen? God, and, and then as God began to think about it, he began to, to feel how awesome it would be to have a person with your exact DNA. Amen? Living at this time with whom and through whom he could work to create the world that he desired. And the more God contemplated the idea of you, 
the more excited God became. And the more excited God became with the idea of you, God began to say, well, that idea can be. But not only should that idea be, not only can that idea be, that idea should be. And the more he considered it, he said, no, that idea must be. And when it was, oh, you got to hear me. Amen. And when God decided, you have to be. You have to be. He took the next step to begin to form you and to create you in your mother's womb. Now, come on, say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Amen. Not only could this idea be, this idea of you should be. Because God could see all he could do with and through such a person with your DNA. And the more he contemplated the idea of you, the more convinced he became that you needed to be. Oh, you, no, you didn't hear me. Come on, if you grab hold of this, the way you look at yourself, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you carry yourself will change altogether. If you got a hold of this, all of the things you've gone through as a child that makes you feel worthless, that makes you feel inferior, that makes you feel small, if you get a revelation that you are the manifestation and the expression, are you hearing me, of an inspired idea that began in the mind and heart of God in the ageless past, amen, and God created you because God was convinced you needed to be. My goodness, my goodness, you don't need anybody else to, to, to approve you, you don't need anybody else to like you, you don't need anybody else to give you a positive word, you know, if they like you, fine, if they don't like you, it doesn't matter, you are the walking manifestation and expression of an inspired idea that entered the mind and the heart of God thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years they go come up somebody say hallelujah let's listen to what David said David had a revelation David said my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully it said skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book that's the vision book that's the dream book that's the architectural design that's the schematic are you hearing me that's the rendering you gotta hear me. in your book they were all written the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. Did you just hear? God has a book, and before you were formed in your mother's womb, God put down, He designed you. Oh my goodness, I'm blessing myself. I said, God designed me. Oh, Shanda, He took the book, He took some time, and He sketched everything about me my DNA everything my color my looks and oh my goodness and oh my goodness and it was not until he was satisfied that what he had put in the book reflected the idea that was in his heart my goodness David said it was all there when there was none of them before he began to create you he had already drawn you David said, how precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Come on, let's say that. How precious. Say that. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they will be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Did you just hear what David said? Yeah. That God's thoughts concerning him were more numerous than the sand? You mean God spends that much time on you? That much time thinking about me? Who doesn't want to serve 
live with no such a God? Why would you want to embrace any other vision than the vision he f- created you and formed you to fulfill? If this is what he has created you to be and do, if this is, if you are the manifestation of a divine idea, that long before he created you, he saw what you could be and do, and therefore put inside of you everything you needed to have and everything he needed you to be so that you could fulfill the vision he had for you. Why would you want to try to be or do anything other than what you were created to be and do? Why would you want to live for anything other than the reason for which he created you? Why would you want to pursue any other vision than the vision he created you for? Why would you think that any other thing could fulfill you better than the thing he created you for? And this is the reason, folks, so many people are dry, empty, joyless, both Christians and non-Christians. Because instead of embracing God's vision, we're trying to establish our own. We're pursuing things, living for things that we were not designed for. And then we wonder why we're never fulfilled. We wonder why someone can become a millionaire, become so popular, the whole world knows him, and everybody thinks he's so happy, and then he commits suicide. Because he was not created for that. You will never, never, never experience true fulfillment. You will never, never walk in joy like you should until you embrace God's purpose, God's plan, the vision he had in mind. You need to embrace his inspired idea concerning you, his vision. I'm so glad that many years ago as a child, I said yes. I said yes to him. You know, I know the questions, many of you are beginning to have a but what is God's vision for me? And what you want is a revelation of the specific things that you need to do. I'm going to talk more about that next week. But the truth is, that really ought not to be your concern. What you need to do is to recognize he has a vision for you and embrace his vision, whatever it is. Are you hearing me? What you need to do is to say yes to him. Do you understand? Yes. To, say, Lord, yes. Even though I don't know what the details of this are, yes. Even though I don't know where it'll take me, yes. Even though I don't know the price I may pay, yes. Whatever you desire me for, I don't need to know right now the details. I'm just saying yes to it because my faith, I know, is the best for me. That's what Jesus did on the cross. For the joy set before him, he said yes to the cross. The day he's seated at the right hand of God. Hear me. You're never going to discover the details until you just say yes to him first and yes to his will by faith. I have found in my own life, because I said yes to him, he's ordered my steps. And I begin to discover the details of the things he has planned for me of that inspired idea that led to my creation, I'm still discovering all that was part of what God had in mind. It's being unfolded every day, but it's all made possible because I am willing to say, I was willing to say yes to God and yes to his will. A total yes, not a, not a provisional yes. Not a conditional yes. But yes. Are you hear me? I'm giving you some good advice. You don't have to follow it, but I'm giving you some good advice. You'll never, never, never experience real fulfillment. You will come to the end of your life wondering whether you did what you were supposed to do. You will come to the end of your life unfulfilled if you never say or if you don't say yes. God and his will. 
Nothing you do or say yes to will fulfill you if you don't say yes to God. Are we still here? To God be the glory. So, so, so the idea of you, the inspired idea of you predated, predated you. And you are the fulfillment of one of God's most, most important visions. Now, it, so there's no doubt that God has a, a personal vision for your life and for my life, right? Is that clear? Can we all say yes to that? Can we all agree that you're not just here by accident, that you are the, the, a direct result of an idea that entered the heart of God in eternity past, and that he formed you for that purpose and has put in you everything you need to be, to do, are you hearing me? What he wants you to do and be? Can you say yes to that? Yes. Amen. Now, we know God has a plan and a vision, so the question I want to ask, what about you? Do you have a plan or a vision, a personal vision for yourself? And even more importantly, have you embraced God's vision for you? Because let me tell you this, just like the vision of this sanctuary will guide everything we will do in the coming years to erect it, the builders will be guided by that plan, that vision. So everything God is doing in your life is being guided and directed by his plan. That is what in part Romans chapter 8 means, 28, when it says all things are working together for your good. It means God is using everything in your life, the good and the bad. Are you hearing me? In order to try to bring to pass his plan for you. But you are a moral agent, and one of the things you're going to have to do is cooperate. Are you hearing me? And the more you cooperate with him, the quicker he can bring it to pass. I, I, I just saw, if sometimes, you know, we wreck something and then God, you know, you build it, you put something, no, you, you, you shouldn't have put that there. This wasn't a plan. Now they have to come back and break it off. I didn't, yeah, yeah. God has to do too many break. You built this, that's not the plan. We gotta cut it off. We got so, so God is spending too much time breaking things off that we're putting there that's not part of the plan. Come on, say yes. Lord, say Lord, yes. One more time, Lord, yes. One more time, Lord, yes. Hallelujah. You need a personal vision for yourself, but in particular, you need to embrace God's vision for you. If you don't have any vision, you need one. Because hear me, visions are helpful in so many ways. One of the ways in which visions work for us is that visions are directional. They give us direction. They, they help us to make better decisions. They help us to get to where we need to be on time. Hmm? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They help you get to where you need to be on time. Men and people are late. Because they have not yet received or said yes to the vision. Now, let me give you a practical example. Before you left your house this morning or this afternoon, hopefully this morning, did you know where you were going? You had a vision of where you wanted to be. And that vision guided you in the choices and decisions you made. You didn't go left, you went right because you knew where you were going. You didn't go on New Hampshire Avenue, you went on Georgia Avenue because you had a vision of where you needed to be. And you knew what time you needed to be here. And your vision of being here at 16227 Bachelors Forest Road in this service it's what guided your decisions. And as you followed the vision, you knew not to go left, you knew to go keep going straight. You knew when to turn right. All of those decisions became easy because you left home knowing where you were going. 
And so hopefully you left home early enough to get here on time. If you had just left home this morning, not knowing where you were going, and just driving, where do you think you would be right now? Nowhere, well somewhere, but not here. Somewhere that you shouldn't be. You might still be driving in your car, just making all the wrong turns. Wasting a lot of time, wasting a lot of money, wasting a lot of fuel, all because you left home not knowing where you're going. And if perchance you finally got here, you would have gotten here too late. If you got here at all. Listen, that's why you need to embrace God's vision for your life. Because until you embrace God's vision for your life, you are going to be wandering aimlessly and you're not going to get there whatever there is as far as God's plan for you certainly you're not going to get there on time listen to what Andy Stanley said in his book he said life visionary life is a journey and every journey has a destination Everybody ends up somewhere in life. A few people, only a few people, end up somewhere on purpose. Let's say that again. Life is a journey, and every journey has a destination. Your life, your life's journey has a destination. Everybody ends up somewhere in life. You will end up somewhere in life. A few people end up somewhere on purpose. And that is what God's vision for your life will empower you to do. It will empower you to end up where you need to be on purpose and on time. Where do you want to end up? Hopefully you want to end up where God wants you to be. Well, if you're going to end up being and doing with your life what God wants you to be and do, you've got to make the critical decision of embracing God's vision for your life, of saying yes, God, to your will. Yes, God, to your plan. Yes, God, to you. It is that decision, unqualified, yes, that will put you in the position for the Holy Spirit to navigate you, to order your steps to the place that God has designed for you. It is that yes that allows the Holy Spirit to begin to do a work in you to make you the person he has designed and intended for you to be. Lord, we got a lot of sad looking people here, but are you following me so far? Is this ministry is this helping you? Because every time we preach or teach, we want to help you, okay? That's all we're trying to do. All right? Now, now, now listen to me. Uh, life is a multifaceted thing. I mean, in other words, there are many sides, there are many different aspects to life. And the truth is, we don't just have one vision. The truth is, we have these many critical areas in our lives, and we really need to have a vision for each of these critical areas. And when I talk about our vision, we need to have an inner picture of what could be and should be in this particular area and what my role or what your role is gonna to be to help create that, okay? So you need a vision, a personal vision for your family. If you're married, for your marriage and your family. There needs to be a picture in your heart of what this marriage and family could be and should be. Are you hearing me? And what your role is gonna to be to help create that, that marriage or that family, that future God has for it. In terms of your career and your profession, you need to have a picture of what could be and should be professionally and the role that you're going to play, that God would have you to play, to help create that future, to make it a reality. So there are different areas, your family and your, 
your, your, your marriage, your, 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 your professional life and your career, your health. You ought to have a vision of what could be and should be. The vision might say you shouldn't be 50 pounds overweight. Because, by the way, you say I'm losing weight, right? Pretty soon I'll be able to unbutton my, my, my coat and you won't see by. <laughs> you see, I have a vision that doesn't include this pot belly. <laughs> so hopefully that vision will help me get there. I'm trying. Okay? But, but without a vision for having a body that doesn't have a pot belly, so I can look as good as some of y'all look. Are you hearing me? Without that vision, I'm not going to get there. I'm always going to have a pot belly. Because I, I don't have to do nothing to have it. But I do have, I have a role to play if I'm going to transform this thing, the role of the pastor, into a six-pack. <laughs> Woo! I'm dreaming of that day. I'm dreaming of that day. And, and, and you'll, you'll know I've gotten there. You'll know I've gotten there when I no longer wear a jacket. Oh, my goodness. When I show up with my, with my, with my shirt tucked into my pants, no jacket, you know I've gotten there. Until then, you will always see a little jacket here. Amen? To God be the glory. Say hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. But you need, we need, you got to have a vision for that area, right? And of course, and this is the most important area, You've got to have a vision for your life spiritually. You've got to. You've got to embrace God's vision for your life spiritually. What could be? What should be? What should your role be in creating this spiritual vision that is in sync with God's for your life? You need a vision for your relationship with Jesus. What should it look like? What could it be? What should it be? And what's your role? You need a vision for your relationship with his body, the church. What could it be? What should it be? And what's your role going to be? You got to have it so you can end up there on purpose. Because if you don't, you're going to continue to have a pot belly. And that spiritual vision of what could be and should be, and your role to bring that about, that spiritual vision of your relationship with God, with Jesus, what's the problem? Give me another mic. Hallelujah. All right, you can still hear me? That spiritual vision of what your relationship with Jesus and with his body should look like, could be, should be, has to be the foundation. It's the most important of all your visions because if you miss it here, you will get all the other visions wrong. You've got to start with that because this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, seek ye first, Jesus said what? Seek ye first. What did Jesus say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That has to be the foundation. If you miss that, if you start developing other visions for your personal life, for your family life, for your marriage, for your finances, for your business, for your ministry, for whatever, if you start with that and you don't Base all of that on the foundation of the spiritual vision God has for you, you're going to get it wrong up here. And by the time you discover you got it wrong, it may be too late. This is what happened to the, to the, to the, to the ruler, I mean the rich man in Luke chapter 12. Jesus said this man, he was a prosperous businessman. And his business prospered to such a degree that he had to to expand, he had, to, he had so much crop, that his, his farms were yielding so much, 
and the Bible says he got up one day and said, what am I going to do? I'm so blessed. I'm so prosperous. I got so much money. I got so much stuff. I want to break down these small barns because they're not enough. I want to build bigger barns and I'm going to store all of my wealth and my riches that I've worked hard for. This is the product of my wisdom and my investment and my sweat. And I'm going to st store these things in these bigger barns. And then I'm going to say to myself, take your ease, man. You, 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 you deserve it. Eat and, and drink and just enjoy yourself. Live it up. You, you deserve it. And Jesus said to that man, you got it wrong. You're a fool. Because tonight, because tonight, I said because tonight, your soul is going to be required of you. You see, here's where this guy missed it. He obviously had a vision for his business. He had a vision for his money. He had a vision for his happiness, but he did not have a spiritual vision. He never embraced the vision that God had for him. And therefore, all the other visions he had were out of sync with God's vision. And so in the end, he, he, he lost everything. You don't want to make that mistake. Yes, have a vision for your family. Yes, have a vision for your career. Yes, have a vision for your finances. Yes, have your vision for your ministry. Yes, yes, yes. But don't begin to develop those visions until you have embraced the spiritual vision that God has for you. Don't begin to develop a vision for all of these other areas until you have said yes to God's will and plan for your life to your relationship with Jesus, to your relationship with his body. You got to say yes there first. That's the foundation. If you don't, you'll mess it up. And let me tell you something about God's vision for your life. The vision God has for your life will always be moral. And the vision God has for your life will always have eternal benefits. The scripture says godliness is profitable for this life and for the life to come. Say this life and the life to come. What that means is any vision that is from God will profit you. It'll be beneficial on this earth, in this life. But if it's from God, it's also gonna be profitable for eternity. If you are engaged in anything, if you're committing yourself, your time, your resources, pursuing any vision, that does not have eternal benefits to it, you know that the vision you are pursuing is not in sync with God's vision for your life. Every true vision from God will be moral and will always profit you in this life and the life to come. If it will not profit you in the life to come, it is not from God. The origin of that vision is from another source. Are you still here? May I keep you a little bit longer? May I? All right. You don't have a vision for this service. Is that you saying? No. But listen to me. I, I'm going to keep you a little bit longer because I would need to complete the message. Hear me. You need to embrace a vision, especially a vision from God, because as I just said, it's directional, correct? But, but here's another reason. It's a vision in general is motivational. It's inspiring. Amen? It, it causes you to get up and do things you wouldn't ordinarily do. It causes you to feel good about things that you would ordinarily feel bad about doing. It takes mundane, ordinary, routine things, things that you ordinarily hate to do, and all of a sudden gives them meaning and significance. It gives you a reason to get up and go. Yes, yes. Amen. Show me a person who's doing nothing. Show me a person who's lazy. Show me a person who is not making progress. And I'll show you a person who does not have a vision. Amen. Are you hearing me? Visions inspire and motivate us. Hallelujah. But God's vision will always motivate you to do that which is right. Amen. And eternal. Amen. That's why you want to embrace God's vision. 
But let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about, why vision, especially God's vision for you, is so important. And this is one of the reasons God gives you his vision, and he wants you to say yes to it, because he knows it's going to inspire you and motivate you to do what's right, even when doing what's right is hard. Now, let me, let me ask you something. If, if, if I told you today that tomorrow, well, after you leave this service, there's someone outside who will be signing you up tomorrow to show up at some work site, and for the whole week, for the whole week, this is what you're going to be doing. Shoveling dirt and filling bags with the dirt. Eight hours a day, shovel dirt, fill it. That's all you know. You're going to show up and you're going to fill bags with dirt. Right after the service, sign up for that. How many of you will be eager? After the service, you're going to head for that table and say, sign me up. Okay, one person. Anybody else? Okay, both of us, the great, oh, there's another person who would, who would do that. So you, you are excited about filling bags with dirt. You're inspired by that. I guess dirt must be your thing. Okay. <laughs> but for most of us, dirt is not our thing. And shoveling dirt is certainly not our thing. Amen? It's certainly not mine. You see my hands? My hands are soft. <laughs> That's for a reason. Amen? I don't like shoveling dirt. Okay? The truth is, and I think even those who raised their hand, raised their hand because they were thinking beyond just the question. The truth is, most of us, I can't say all because one or two persons raised their hands, most of us, the great majority, would not even look for the table. You wouldn't even ask, where's the table? You wouldn't approach the table. Amen? Because the idea of shoveling dirt and filling bags for one week it doesn't move you, it, it doesn't get you excited one bit. That's the last thing you want to be doing this week is shoveling dirt and filling bags. Isn't that so? But what if, I said, there is a flood that is threatening to destroy an entire town near us. Many lives are at risk of being lost. Many homes will be destroyed. Many old people will be in great danger. We've got to do whatever we can to save the city. To do so, we need to build a dike around the city to protect the city from the flood. To preserve the homes and more importantly the lives of the people of that city. How many of you would say, I'm, count me in. If this is what it's going to take, count me in. Well, more of you, I thought all of you would, but some folks, they don't care what happened there. <laughs> they, they just hate dirt so much, they're going to let folks die, and they're going to let, you know, but some of us can overcome our hatred for dirt. If, if it's me, we're going to save some lives, right? Say hallelujah. hallelujah. The truth is, most of us who wouldn't even consider just filling bags with dirt would go out on Monday and spend all week if necessary if we knew that we were not just shoveling dirt, we were saving a city. We were not just shoveling death, uh, dirt, we were saving old people from death. We were, we were not just shoveling dirt, we were preserving the homes and of, of uh, thousands of people. We would do it because all of a sudden we realize we're not shoveling dirt, we're saving a city. We're not shoveling dirt, we're saving people from death. We're not shoveling dead, dirt, we're keeping people in their homes who otherwise would lose them. You see the vision of what could be or what should be, of the difference shoveling dirt could make, it is the vision of the difference that we could make and our role in making it happen that would take people who hate shoveling dirt and make them eager and willing to do so without asking for a penny. Visions have the power to motivate and inspire you. But there's no vision that, is, that will inspire you more and motivate you more than a vision from God. Say hallelujah. That vision will cause you to be willing to give your life. 
And that is why you and I need to embrace his vision for us. Because watch this. If you don't embrace his vision, then many of the things he will ask you to do will seem to you like shoveling dirt. Coming to church will be shoveling dirt. You're not motivated to do that. That's why you don't come very often. Serving as an usher will feel like shoveling dirt. Standing in the parking lot to park cars will feel like shoveling dirt. Working with children in a children's ministry, wiping noses, changing diapers, that would really seem like shoveling dirt. Mentoring youth, that's like shoveling dirt. Giving my offering, paying or giving my tithes, making a pledge to a capital campaign building fund. Without the vision, unless you see that it is not what you're doing, but why you're doing it, what you do will seem too often routine, mundane, and just shuffling dirt. But I pray that your eyes will open and I pray that you will understand that you are an inspired idea of God and when God created you, he created you to work with you, to work through you, to create the future he had in mind for this world. I hope you will understand that having created you, you haven't said yes, he is in fact working in you now and working through you to create the world that he has planned and that you are an instrument in his hands. That when you serve and when you smile, you are not shuffling dirt, but you are actually being used by him. You're letting him use you to save the world. You're, you're, you're letting him use you to draw or to bring someone closer to him. I, I hope you understand as you usher someone to their seat, you are not just shoveling dirt. You are actually bringing that person closer to God. I hope you see that your, your smile can bring someone closer to God. I hope you see that every time you are moved and given an opportunity to give, whether it's your time, your talent, or your treasure, and you obey, you're actually letting God use you to save the world. You're actually letting God use you to bring somebody closer to him. You are not just doing mundane, unimportant, routine stuff. You are actually being used by God to fulfill that divine idea that originated in his mind in ageless past. You are being an instrument he is working through to save the world. An instrument he is working through to draw people who are far from him closer and closer to him. Your smile can do that. Your hands can do that. When you go and visit someone in the hospital, you let him use you to draw someone closer to you. When you take time to encourage someone whose heart is broken, you let him work through you to draw them closer to you. Are you hearing me? When you see that, then you will discover a new sense of fulfillment and joy in doing what you do. But until you do that, every time you're challenged to make a sacrifice or to give something of yourself, you will see it as shuffling dirt. And then you will lose the joy that could be yours. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Well, up the joy that was set before him, the cross would have seemed to him as shuffling dirt. But when he could see what God was going to do through him, the people who were going to be drawn close, that God was actually using him to save the world, he embraced the cross. Oh, may God help you to see that you are an inspired idea that has manifested and that he is already right now working in you and through you. And every time you decide to obey him, to serve, to give, to do something as he prompts you to do, 
You are actually letting him work through you to draw someone closer to him, to save the world, to create the future he has in mind for this world, which is better than the one we have today. Come on, say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory be to God. Now let me wrap up. I'll bring you back to this church at the Bethel. Because you see, you see, I told you God has a personal vision for you. We're not mass produced. Each of us are individualized and specifically made. And God has a plan for each life. I'm looking at all of you and you guys each look different. You were not mass produced. Thank God. It would be boring to see all of y'all looking like me. Thank God he's made each of us specific. So you have, and he has a personal plan for your life. But here is the question I want to ask you. Why has he ordered your steps at this time to this church? Why has he worked in your life in such a way to make you part of this community? If he has a plan and he's working it out, assuming you are led here, you just showed up, then you need to... I asked him to tell you, but if, you, if you're being led here, then you need to ask yourself, why is he ordering my steps or has ordered my steps to this community at this time? I'll tell you why. It is because the personal vision he has for you is tied to and connected to the vision he has for this community. There's something that he conceived in the ageless past when he saw you and he had the idea of you that included this community of people. He's leading you here because this is where you will get to walk in and fulfill the vision he has for you. And what's inside of you is tied to and connected to what he's doing with us together. So, so here's the question I asked the Lord, and I've been asking this Lord long before I got, even got this message. I said, Lord, help me to be able to express our vision in a way that that, that is clear and, and, and everybody can relate to it and people can understand and they can share it easily with others and they can remember. We have a mission statement. Our mission statement is win the loss at all costs. That is fine. But our vision statement was long and, and, and it's good but it's too complicated and so we don't use it much. And I, and I said, Lord, we, we need something different, something real, real simple. Because the older I get, the more simple things have to be for me to understand it and get excited about it. So how do we take this complicated, complex vision statement? Lord, how do we express it? Give me a fresh way to be able to express it. It's been over a year and, and I've tried different, different stuff and nothing just seemed right. And I wasn't thinking about it really. I wasn't thinking about it recently, but I was just, I don't know what I was doing, but I wasn't praying. I wasn't, I may have been praying the Holy Ghost because sometimes I just pray the Holy Ghost when I'm walking. But I wasn't seeking the Lord, so to speak, specifically about this. And all of a sudden, something very simple, but for me, very inspiring, popped out of my spirit. And when it did, I said, ah, I believe this is what I've been looking for. I believe he's answering my prayer. I believe he is expressing our vision in a very simple and precise way so that everybody who's part of this community will be able to understand it relate to it and connect their own personal vision to it. And you know what it was? I've already used the phrase already, but this is what came and popped out of my spirit. Bringing people closer to God. Simple, concise, precise, memorable, and if you think about it, very inspiring. Why does this community exist? Why is God connecting you here? Because God wants us to be a, a caring community of believers who do one thing and do one thing real well. We bring people closer to God. Say comma by bringing God to them. Amen. So, 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 so now, now I understand I'm not just shoveling dirt this morning as I preach to you. I know why God brought me here because God wants to work through me. In ageless past, God had an inspired idea of how he would work in and through me to bring people closer to him through my preaching 
And God got excited about it and said, this could be, this should be, this must be, and he created me. Wow. And in each last past, God got excited about you and how he could work with you and through you to bring people closer to him. Come on. By bringing God to them. And God said, you could be. You should be. You must be. And he created you. This is why we're here. This is why you give. It's to bring people closer to God. This is why we're going to spend millions of dollars on television and radio to bring people closer to God. I just had, you know, we have this, this thing at the church, the guests reception. I was just talking to a brother named Greg. He's been coming for about three weeks. He said the re reason he got here was on Sunday morning he was flipping the TV and he saw, he saw me on TV and he stopped and whatever he was hearing bless his heart so much. He did some more research and more he saw on the internet bless his heart. And he showed up here on Vision Sunday. He showed up here last Sunday. He showed up here this Sunday and he said, I'm, I'm ready to join the church but you guys haven't told us how to join the church. So he's been sitting here ready to join, but we never told him how to join. Guess what? Whatever money we're spending for television and radio is to bring people closer to God. Greg is being brought closer to God. Mm -hmm. And do you know why we're going to spend up to $10 million if that's what God, it, well, what it ends up being? Yes, it is to bring people closer. To God. And I love it because you see, everybody needs to be brought closer to God. My mama needs to be brought. Your father needs to be brought. Your brother needs to be brought. Your sister needs to be brought. Your employer needs to be brought. Your, 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 the person who's unsaved needs to be brought closer to God. And a person like me who's been saved over 50 years, I too need to be brought closer to God. All of us are on a journey and all of us need to get closer and closer to God. And wonderful things happen when we draw closer to him. Because he said, when you draw nigh to me, I will draw nigh to you. We discover things, we see things, we know things, we enter into realms of possibilities. Our faith grows, our love deepens. We are changed every time we draw closer. So whether it's evangelism, out there in the world. Bethel, we are a community of caring believers who draw people closer to God. And you will draw them closer with your smile. You will draw them closer with your acts of love and kindness. You will draw them closer sometimes by giving them a track. You will draw them closer sometimes by preparing a meal for them. Listen to me. You may not be the one that leads the sinner to, to, to accept Christ. But if he's at 10, whenever you interact with him and you allow God to use you, you may move him over to nine. He's not yet at the point of salvation, but you have drawn him closer to God. And then somebody else will come and draw him a little bit closer. And some other person by his smile, by their love, by their service, by their words of encouragement. Until finally one day that person may come to church, Bishop Johnson will give the invitation. And I will be the last link in a process that God started with you two years ago. Can you embrace that? Can you see how, no matter what the specific details of his plan for your life, they are connected to this corporate vision God wants and God will work through you if you let him to bring people closer to him. So you make yourself available. Say yes to him. Say yes, use me to bring people closer to you. Use me, my time, my talent, my treasure. Use me to bring people closer to you. In whatever way you choose, yes, Lord. In Jesus' name.